So this is my Tesla Model 3. I say mine, it's not really mine. It doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the leasing company. I lease it from the leasing company. And that means that I can actually afford to have an amazing, incredible electric car like this. Couldn't have possibly afford to buy it. So does it make sense for companies that supply cars to their employees, does it make sense for them to supply electric cars instead of combustion ones? Let me think on that for a moment. Yes, of course it makes sense makes a huge amount of sense and that's what we're here today to find out quite how all that stuff works because I've heard these terms like benefit in kind I don't know what that means genuinely I haven't got a clue what that means now this is specific to the UK market but many of the topics we're going to talk about are not they are generalized around the world what these cars represent is a big challenge to the to the status quo you know you pay for for liquid fuel for your combustion engine and you pay tax on that fuel I don't pay tax on the electricity that goes into this car, never will. You can't tax electricity, it's not possible. So how are we going to make sure that people who drive cars pay for the upkeep of the roads that they drive on? Those are the things we're going to find out. So this is a slightly dirty, needs a wash, Tesla Model 3. This is the glorious headquarters of Fully Charged Show International. <laughs> and this is Fully Charged. So Matthew, thank you for coming along. And, thank uh, you. Uh, and I, th you've got quite a task ahead of you to explain these things to me, because I'm not very good at understanding them. But the point I think is that I hear all the time, oh, I'd love an electric car, but I can't afford them. They're too okay. expensive to buy. And I mean, I can't afford to buy the car I drive, a Tesla Model 3. It's, I mean, how on earth would I get that much money to pay for it like cash? But I lease it. And, uh, and I think now a lot of people do lease it. And I think a yep. lot of people who see the price of an electric car and go, that's more than the cheapest petrol, which it is. Mm -hmm. How on earth can I ever afford that? And I mean, if you actually look at the, the, some of the lease deals now on the cheaper electric cars, I think are incredibly, yeah, fantastic. incredibly uh, attractive. But the, the, there's other benefits. And this is what I, so I've heard the term <laughs> benefit in kind right okay wow it means nothing to me i haven't got a clue and i don't know if i'm even getting benefit in kind i think i might be but i don't know so okay. what is benefit in kind so benefit in kind is um a taxation that applies to a company car in essence right. or a benefit in kind is to a, a tax that applies to any benefit that you have and the way it works for a company car um is depending on the fuel type um you will have uh, there's a there's a lovely table from hmrc right and you look up on the table your co2 and that will tell you the percentage to apply to the what they call the P11D value of the car. P11D is not complicated. It's the list price of the car, including options, um, including VAT, um, without any other discounts. So you right. know what, what you pay, including the options right. flat. Then you apply the percentage, and it for a diesel, a typical diesel, for example, or a petrol, it can be as high as 20, 25 percent of that P11D value. Right. That becomes your taxable value. So there's a big chunk of money. And then depending on whether you're a 20% or a 40% tax rate payer, that's actually how much it costs you in the end. The fantastic thing about electric vehicles, which people are, are switching onto, right. um, and it's and, and it's been in the it's been in in the offing for a while now, but the government confirmed in March in the budget for the for the next five years what the taxation was going to be for company cars. For EVs, right now, the percentage that you apply is zero. So even though you've got right. this calculation that says I've got a fifty thousand pound electric car, yeah. um, the percentage that applies to start the calculation is naught. So you're not paying any company car tax at all. Right. So my diesel car that was let's just say it was fifty thousand pounds for argument's sake, yeah. and I'm going to pay twenty five percent of that five thousand pound will be taxed on that value. The starting calculation for an electric car is naught. Right. And it goes to one percent next year. 2% the year after and then it holds at 2%. Wow. So from a benefit in kind perspective, as an employer, the car is still a lease contract with myself and my leasing company. Right. But when I give that to my employee as a company car, it costs my employee nothing. Right, right. So from an employee perspective, it's fantastic. And then what you can do is you can get very clever, um, which is where we're seeing huge amounts of activity at the moment, 
is you can then provide that to your employee through a salary sacrifice arrangement. Because I'm still bearing quite a lot of the cost as an employer. Yeah. It's still costing me quite a lot of money to lease from my leasing company. I give it to my employee for free. Well, my employee last car was used to paying, you know, 150, 200 pounds a month in company car tax, which right. he's now not paying. So why don't I ask him for 150 to 200 pounds contribution to the electric car? Right. So you do this swap in salary because of the tax benefits on EV. Yeah. And all of a sudden, companies have got a really efficient way of providing electric vehicles to their employees. Right. And actually the employees, because you're thinking, oh, is that fair on the employees? The employees are getting a really cheap, they are. incredibly cheap lease. They are. And, and they've got a car, and presumably in those circumstances, it is effectively their car for the duration of that lease. I mean, they're not like leaving it at work. It's nope. not just, it's not nope. like if you've got a delivery van, it's your own car that you're driving. That's right. Yeah. And you know, right. I mean, you know very well what, what EVs are like to drive, yeah. what they're like inside, how well they're spec'd. Um, so well, you're, how you're, cheap they're to run from a fuel yeah. point of view. I mean, that's the other thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So as a company car and, and people get a little bit energized about the average energy rate. So if you're in a diesel or a petrol car, you claim business mileage at the advisory fuel rate. Right. Electric isn't a fuel. Um, try telling your electricity company that, yes. but it's not a fuel <laughs> as far as revenue are right. concerned. So you claim it at four pence a mile and everybody kind of goes, that sounds awfully low. Yeah. But when you calculate your kilowatt hours on the average yeah. national rate, it covers it. Yeah. So my diesel car was costing me, I'm claiming 12 pence a mile, which just about covers it. Right. My electric is 4p. That right. gives you an immediate illustration of just what the difference is yeah. between the two. And I mean, it it's so dependent on how you charge it then in that case. Because yeah. I mean, obviously there's wear and tear, there's t you know, tires. The one thing that I'm now aware of is in electric cars because there's nothing else. <laughs> I don't, right. I don't think of, there's screen wash, which I'm still quite bitter about because that's <laughs> expensive. And then there's tires, you know, those two things are exactly yeah. the same as any other car that you do have to take into account. But other than that, the fuel can be so low depending on how you charge it. But even if you charge at home off peak, if you have a variable yep. tariff, that can go down to, you know, you're actually looking at fuel cost of around one, maybe one or two pence. Very, very low indeed. Yeah. As an individual, if, you, if you're a private individual, you don't have a limited company, you're not a company, yep. you're just a private person, what are the benefits there? Are there, are there any tax benefits from having an, an EV so, there? Yeah, so the, e the easiest benefit about leasing to get people's heads around is VAT. Right. So because your leasing company or a lessor um, goes and buys that vehicle, but they're buying it for 100% they're buying it for their business in effect yeah. so it's a hundred percent business use so we claim all of the vat off the purchase right. price which means when we lease it to you now there are restrictions in the lease that need to be thought about but in essence the first benefit you get as the lessee as, as the person receiving yeah. the vehicle is 20 percent off the, the, the cost price effectively. because you're right. not paying vat yeah. as you would have done before yeah. as a private individual you have to factor in VAT. So as a private, a personal contract hire deal or PCP, right. there's VAT involved, but you're getting a fully maintained vehicle and you're only paying for what's called the gap. So in effect, your lease co will look and say, how much has the car cost me? How much is it? How much do we think we're gonna flog the piece of kit for in three years time, right. four years time, whatever the contract is, and you're paying for the gap yeah. with a bit of interest. Right. So buying it also takes all the risk away from you because you can now have a fully maintained vehicle um, you can even have it fully insured now depending on where you lease from so right. you can bundle insurance in as well wow. so the only thing you're doing is putting fuel in the vehicle yeah and in the case of an ev that's four pence a mile yes yeah and then so then well, here's a, a thing that i would not thought of before because we're just getting to that point now that electric cars have been around long enough is what the kind of the the industry uh, opinion is of at the end of a three or four year lease and you're going to sell that vehicle how that's holding up in terms of the vehicle value the the, the durability of the cars i mean is that something you're i'm presuming it's something you're aware of yes yeah so <laughs> getting better right um, i think is probably yeah. is probably i'm just thinking my, my original nissan leaf that, that from 2011 that would be quite a hard sell now because it's its range is i, I think it's fair to call it limited 
Yeah, and I think you've hit on a really good point. So the, the, the challenge that we've had as an industry is we, we have to scratch our heads. And if you think about, you know, we, we, we've got circa 1.8 million vehicles on the road globally as right. lease plan. That's an awful lot of risk to take. Yeah. You know, you only need to get your numbers wrong by a, a tiny, couple of percent yes, and you're yeah. in trouble. So, you know, scratching your head when we when we did the first Tesla S's, when they came out in the Tesla X's yeah. and the Nissan Leafs, we had to be conservative right. in, in our numbers and our thinking. And as they get returned, and as we see what's actually happening, that residual value strengthens because right. we're able to be a, a bit less risk, risk averse as an industry, as, yeah. a, as a body. Um, but you're right, the technology from the early days, so the early Nissan Leafs, for example, that's a difficult one because you know they're less desirable because of the lower battery range. Yeah. However, they're still attractive for you know Joe Public out there, or, yeah. or, or or as a second use, particularly if they're doing lots of hops. You know, they're doing lots of short journeys. Yeah. They're not so concerned about you know has my battery degraded, yeah. um, which again we're finding all of the things that we thought were going to happen with batteries hasn't happened, yes. they haven't yeah. degraded like we no. thought they would. Um, so they make an ideal second purchase now. So all of those things are coming together to strengthen that position. Right, because I mean, that's, the, that's the, the, the key argument I use when people say, oh, I'd love to have an electric car, but I can't afford one. And I go, well, I, I didn't ever buy a new car. I think it was in my mid fifties when I first bought a new car. Yeah. Right. And even then I was going, why did I do that? That was a stupid thing to do. <laughs> because it you know lost it lost you know that's it lost a lot of value immediately. That was a, well, a combustion turn, they, car. They say you turn a wheel and you lose fifteen percent. Yeah. And whereas now I lease cars, it's just so much less of a anxiety the anxiety's gone of that ownership model because mm. you know, and I look after them and I don't want to damage them, but you you know, because I rely on it. But but it isn't there isn't that sort of dead weight of of anxiety about it. And there's also I haven't bought it. You know, it's not it, effectively it's not, it's not mine. I'm renting it. You are. Yeah, I'm renting a car. You are. For you're a few renting years. it, and and so long as you give it back in reasonable condition, yeah. and you know, you you tell your leasing company if there's been any change in mileage, yeah. so you're communicating with them. So so long as you get your numbers right, why would you buy something? Why would you just not use it? Yeah, and give and it we, back uh, in three uh, years' time. Is it now? Uh, I mean. I, do most people now lease if they if they're using new cars, or is it, I don't know what percentage of the market is leased. It sounds like it's quite a lot of people. Do yeah, it? it is, and it's increasing. Right, and, and certainly what we've seen, what we've seen through COVID, um, what we what we've seen through this crisis is that people are moving to leasing. They don't right. want to look at that outlay. So people are looking again and realizing just how beneficial it is. Yeah. Um, you are borrowing. I mean, you're borrowing money. You're borrowing money off somebody, which you know if that's where people's minds have to go, well, I'm actually effectively taking out the loan for something. Yeah. Um, you are, but you're not forking out, you know, 25, 30,000 pounds, or, or as we know, in, for an electric vehicle, it can be a substantial yeah. amount of money. Albeit, we're seeing models now come into the they marketplace. They are getting cheaper, yeah. yeah. You know, ID3 is gonna launch with a price tag of something like 28, 29,000 yeah. for the standard model. So, again, though, all these things are coming together now to right. make electric vehicles the, 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 almost the only choice, yeah. really. Yeah. So, I mean, I think then the result of that is that there's going to be a lot more second-hand cars on the market in the next few years. I mean, it's just going, that's going to be... If, if there's a constant increase in the amount of electric cars you're leasing, for instance, yep. through you then in three or four years time, they're going to come onto the, the second hand market. They are. So we're going to, so that's going to be interesting when that becomes a, a much bigger market. Or that, it's, not, it's not so much second hand, I think it's third, fourth, fifth hand. I mean, that's all the cars I bought when I was a young man were fourth, fifth, seventh hand, completely. And that's going to, that, that is going to be interesting yeah. because you, you then start asking questions, particularly when you get to fourth hand or you know, 20 years old, you start asking questions about so is it is it then economically is the battery then economically viable? Yeah. Um, is there an opportunity to reuse the battery? There's yeah. a stadium in Spain whose whose floodlights are, are powered by EV batteries in, yes. in essence. Um, so they tend to be reused, recycled yeah. in that manner. But you are talking a, a good number of years before that happens. Yeah. The, the story that we the the myth, I guess, if we do myth busting for a minute, 
that, that we thought was going to happen where you were going to get your EV and then to put it to the second hand market you're going to need to take the battery out and yeah. put it back again it's nonsense it, no. just, it just hasn't happened yeah. you know you, you batteries degrade by perhaps three four maybe even five percent over their initial contract term of three or four years when yeah. you by the time you're sending them back they've degraded almost nothing yeah and if you've got a battery that gives you a range like a, a Kona for instance with yep. a sort of really plausible 280 I mean it says 300 but in real terms when it's windy and rainy 280 yeah it's good but then if you lose 5% of that so what's 5% then of it if you've lost 5% on your Kona 14 miles something something it's not it isn't that big a deal it's not that big a deal and people forget they look and they they immediately look at battery degradation people forget that the car the the ice car that you buy the internal combustion engine car that you buy You know, the MPG doesn't stay what it was no, when you bought it. it. That gets worse. It gets worse. Yeah. The CO2 gets worse. Yeah. You just there's, there's just no tangibility yeah. to it. You don't notice it because, again, you can rock up at a fuel station and fill up. Nobody's thinking about, well, actually, the MPG of my car on paper was 50 miles a gallon, yeah. for example. What's, what's happened to it over three years? Because yeah. it's gone down, yeah. funny enough. Yeah. So then, okay, so then let's jump forward to, I don't know what, Let's go five years. So we're not quite at the 2030, you know, cut off point. point. But I'm assuming there's going to be an enormous amount more electric vehicles on the road yep. by then. Uh, hope so. Uh, yeah, we hope so. And it certainly looks that way. So then the, and there's been some discussion about this, particularly in Australia recently, is how you, because at the moment I've got an electric car. It's a, I think it's a huge privilege. You've got to be, you know, wealthy enough to, to you know, pay the lease and run it and yep. charge it at home and all those things that you kind of, I take for granted in my liberal bubble of elitist something or other. I'm just remembering <laughs> of the terms I've been called on Twitter. But eventually, and I don't pay any road tax or I don't pay no. a, a road no. fee to, to use it. It's free at the moment. And I don't pay any tax on the fuel I put in the car, like, which you both, if you've got a combustion car, you're paying both of those. So if there's now, say, two, three million electric cars on the road and they're not paying, it, that's going to change. There's yes. no government's going to tolerate that. And what they've just introduced in Australia is a, or they've talked about introducing a, I think a, a one and a half or two cents a mile or a kilometre road charge for electric vehicles, which is a little bit premature in Australia. Because they've got so many they've in got, Australia, right? <laughs> got, there's seven. I mean, the thing is, I've made a joke that I know everyone in Australia who's got an electric car. It's not entirely untrue. But so what will happen here, do you think? I mean, is it going to be... Will it be, it's got to be a, a, di- a distance tax. You can't tax the electricity. I it's, mean, road user, it's, road, it's road user pricing. Yeah. Uh, and whether it's a very, very divisive issue. So there's a, there's a well-trodden phrase about road user pricing that the, the party that proposes it in their manifesto won't get into power. Right. And the, power, and the party, the government that brings it in will be out at the next election. Right. But we have to be sensible about this. Yeah. The government for many many years you know as well as i do that you know the pump price that you pay something like 68 70 percent of it is either tax or duty yeah. whether that's vat etc so with that amount going into the coffers it has to be replaced with something and actually some of the the industry bodies that you know that we're that we're part of so british vehicle rental and leasing association for example and ourselves are lobbying government to think about it now right you if, if 2030 is a reality you have to join up with the Office of Tax Simplification and all these different departments that are looking at these things mm. and bring it all together under one umbrella. Because otherwise, to try and meet your 2030 target, you're going to rush a piece of legislation yeah. through, which isn't gonna work. Yeah. People have to be sensible now and understand that road user pricing is something that needs to come in, not on top of vehicle excise duty, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, as a replacement for. Yes. So yeah. look at the whole thing how do you solve the challenge of x billion pounds not coming into my coffers yeah. anymore the urge to the government really is make it once again about road usage yeah so yes you take a huge amount of taxation everybody accepts that yeah. and it goes into the coffers and we get pothole funds and this yeah. and the other nobody believes that those billions or those they, you know those you billions know. go towards our road in in totality so be fair look at the overall taxation system and we have one of the most complex taxation systems in the, in the world right. um, look at it from a road use perspective we're always going to be wedded to our cars we love our cars in yeah. the uk make it fair for everybody and make it about road use yeah so so one last thing matthew is is um you, 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 the company leases the car 
the, 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 the one of their employees benefits from that. They, dr they drive home, they've got a charger at home, they plug yep. it in. So they're paying for that fuel. But then when they come into work, this is going to happen more and more. We've got it here, even here, we've got uh, chargers. Uh, you know, a company could supply free charging for their employees while they're at work. How Ooh, does we're that? Into, we're into benefit yeah. in kind again that, there. That, that becomes benefit in kind. It must do, mustn't it? Because there's got to be an implication for that. It's like you go into your office and there's a free petrol pump. Yeah. It's exactly the same as that. Yeah. So what's really good and what the government have done, which is fantastic, is that your, your home charger, so if you're supplied a home charger as part of your lease, it's, it's non-benefit in kindable. You don't get taxed. Right. On, which is great. Obviously, there's no tax when you charge at home because you can't distinguish between the charger used at the house and the charger used in the car, yeah. which is great. But you turn up at your office and you plug in and you're getting free electric, that becomes a challenge. Right. And then you need to work out, well, how many miles did I do and was it personal and private? So our recommendation actually is that the driver pays for everything. Right. So when you rock up at the office, you have a fob. Yeah. And most of the providers will, 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 will provide you with yeah. one which you show to your charge point when you plug in and you're charged through your expenses right. for the fuel, the energy that yeah. you've put in your car. And then all you're then doing is claiming your business mileage back right. at, four, at the four pence a mile. The good thing with that is whether you charge at the office, charge at home, or you know when you charge out and about, it discourages your employees from using the more expensive charging options and they become a kind of last resort. Right. Like putting petrol in at the motorway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in essence, your employee charges at home, charges at the office, charges out and about, does what he needs to do, right. pays for everything, and they claim back at four pence a right, mile. Right, right. And that, it's very that's simple the, for simple everybody. Because actually, the charges we've got here, we have to pay for. You know, they're, yeah. they're not free. So I don't know about you, but I actually learnt stuff uh, from this episode, which is, you know, which is always a benefit. That's a, that's a big plus. I, I absolutely accept it's very, very specific to the United Kingdom. It's not international. There's different arrangements apply all over the world. There's different ways of renting and leasing cars, absolutely. But we just thought it was worth going over the, the basics for what, what goes on in this country. And just to show that you don't actually have to buy a new electric car to be able to drive one. You can find other ways of doing it. There's lots and lots of brilliant different leasing uh, systems around the world. Anyway, that's all we've got time for. So do please subscribe to the Fully Charged Show. Please have a look at the Patreon link that's beneath this video. Check out YouTube memberships. Some very exciting things going on there. Tell your friends and family. That really helps. Spread the word about all the fully charged organic goodness that's, <laughs> that's available for free. If you don't want to pay for anything, that's fine. That's what we're here for. And that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for watching.